want to welcome you this morning to Snapshot. As a matter of fact, also welcome to the Ridge Church. So glad you're here. And I just want to tell you about a couple of things to, to be aware of that are upcoming events here at the Ridge Church. Of course, as always, pay attention to the bulletin because everything's important. But let me just mention a couple. Number one, this Tuesday, we have Silver Saints. That's all of our senior adults coming together to be in the fellowship hall. Uh, as a matter of fact, it'll be at 11.30 in the, mor uh, in the morning is whenever it starts. It's going to be an exciting time, a great time to bring, be able to break bread together and just hang out. There's a lot of laughter there. An incredible time. Silver Saints, this Tuesday, 11.30 in the Fellowship Hall. Secondly, Awana's registration is this Wednesday, August 18th. Again, this Wednesday, August 18th, from 6.45 to 7.45 p.m., so please come and register your children for Awanas. We're in for a great year. It's just around the corner, and we're excited about what God's going to do through this great next generation. Hey, this is movie week here at the Ridge. Here's what I mean by that. Two movies to mention to you today. Number one, the drive-in movie night. That is this Friday night, August 20th at 8 p.m. It's going to be out on the north lot. Okay, again, that is this Friday night, August 20th at 8 p.m. We're going to have hot dogs and popcorn and snow cones and soft drinks and all kinds of stuff. It's a free event. It'll be an incredible time. You'll be able to sit in the, in the comfort of your own car and be able to hear it on your own radio. So hope you'll come. If it rains, we're still going to have it. It'll just move into the fellowship hall, okay? So the rain, uh, if it comes, would, it would move it into the fellowship hall. And then also the second movie night of the week is a week from today on Sunday, uh, the 22nd of August. It's Sunday uh, afternoon, and it's a children's movie night, a children's movie night from 4 to 6 p.m. It'll be in the fellowship hall as well. And uh, it's every, from everybody from four years old to uh, fifth grade. It's, of course, families, parents, grandparents, everybody can come. But especially four years old to the fifth grade, if, if a child is first grade and under, then they do need to be accompanied by an adult the entire time. It's going to be a great week here at the Ridge Church. Hey, I want to take you to a verse of Scripture found in the longest chapter in the Bible, Psalms 119 and verse 11. Many know this verse and have it committed to memory. It says, Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Your word, the Bible, I have hidden in my heart. Why? That I might not sin against you. You know, the more of this precious, inerrant, infallible book, the Bible, that we hide in our heart through Scripture memory, I believe the more ability that God gives us to be able to walk a life that would be effective and honoring to Him. So, hey, right now we have an opportunity to worship together. I'm going to encourage you to stand and join in in worship. Good morning. Of course, we've been talking about the uh, names of Jesus, so we're going to sing about the great I am. He is the great I am this morning. Let's worship him together.
give the great I am to him this morning. Of course, all he's done for us, that's uh, the very least that we could do. But uh, we, we serve a great risen Lord. And so glad you're here this morning to worship him. Hope you're all in this morning, forgetting about everything else, but just putting everything toward God and listen to his voice and uh, waiting for him to change you into what he wants you to be. So glad that you're here if you're visiting for the first time as well, or if you haven't been here in a while, there's a little uh, uh, perforation on, hey, I said that word, I didn't know if I could, on the, uh, the uh, worship folder, I'm going to call it worship folder, and uh, you tear that off, fill it out, and put it in the offering box in the back, we sure appreciate that, and if you uh, take it to the little window, the information window out there, they'll give you a gift as well, but uh, so glad you're here today, but most of all to worship our great Lord and Savior. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray that this will be a time that's just set aside to practice for this week, so that during this week we might worship you with all of our heart, mind, and soul. Lord, speak to us. Help our hearts and our minds to be ready. We give it all to you, Lord. In Jesus' wonderful name I pray. Amen. Hope you'll keep worshiping with us here. Amen.
something to be glad about, right?
we praise you. Accept our praise this morning, please, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Be seated. Well, excited to be able to be with you all uh, today. And uh, we are going through a series of the names of God. And so I have the opportunity today to talk about the horn of my salvation. The horn of my salvation. As a matter of fact, uh, that is, uh, it, it, you know, it's one of my favorite things to be able to talk about whenever Roger was saying, hey, what would you, and it's everybody's favorite thing to talk about, but what would you like to be able to do? I chose uh, Jehovah Karen Yesha, and that's the last time you're going to hear me say it because I respect the language too much to say it like a Missouri hillbilly, okay? But it means in English, the horn of my salvation, okay? And I'm going to put my phone right there, not because I'm going to look at the time. Sorry, you're out of luck there, but because it's too lumpy in my pocket, so... Uh, but yeah, excited to be able to share. I want to ask you to turn with me this morning to two passages of Scripture. Number one, if you'd turn to Mark chapter 10, Mark chapter 10, we're going to be looking at verses 17 through 22. It'll be on the screen as well, but if you have your copy of God's Word, Mark chapter 10, uh, verses 17 through 22. Put your silk ribbon there, a marker of some sort, and then turn over to Psalms chapter 18. Psalms chapter 18. So we're going to begin reading in Psalms chapter 18. But then quickly, in a very short period of time into the message, I want to flip over to Mark chapter 10. The horn of our salvation, we know what that's about. As a matter of fact, in Psalms chapter 18, David was just delivered by his enemies. It's an incredible story. And he immediately writes a song to God in appreciation for that deliverance. Now, we know that, that you know, it's kind of interesting how that all pans out. Because this book, the Bible, there's one author, and that's God. He uses 40 different human instruments, but one of those is King David writing this song, but we even know even that's inspired by God, uh, talking about uh, his deliverance. And later on in chapter 18, we're not going to look at that this morning, but later on in chapter 18, it even gives this great projection of the future of a Messiah that's going to come and even an anticipation of a resurrection. It's incredible whenever God is telling people what to write and how full that picture is every time. But time after time, we can talk about horn, the horn itself in the Old Testament. It's always about deliverance. It's always about protection. It's always about provision that's not, that you're not worthy of receiving. And we know that the culmination of all that is Jesus. And he is the horn of my salvation. Amen? He's the horn of our salvation. He's the only way. So what I want to do is just look at this little verse of Scripture here, really three verses of Scripture in Psalms 18, verses 1, 2, and 3. And then we're going to jump over to Mark 10, because in Mark 10, there's this incredible story that many of us know that I think that we need to look at, and I'll tell you why here in just a moment. But here we are in Psalms 18, verse 1. I will love you, O Lord, my strength. My Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. Did you hear all that? My Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer. We just sang about it a moment ago. My God is my strength in whom I will trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation. Say horn of my salvation. And the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. Uh, so, shall, so shall I be saved from my enemies. And so we just know that David here is writing about some recent victories that should have not taken place that God bailed him out of and that God delivered him from and then it goes on to point toward the greatest victory of all uh, that we benefit from and uh, f- uh, that we're over- able to overcome the greatest enemy, the most horrible enemy of all. That's our own sin, that's the devil, that's eternity in hell and it's all because of the horn of my salvation. And so what I want to do is quickly flip over to Mark chapter 10 and here's why. So now the horn of my salvation is here in human form at this point of the, of the story, all right? Jesus is here. He's 100% God, yet 100% man. And here's what happens. This incredibly cool thing takes place. You've heard the story many times. But there's this man that came running to Jesus and asked him a question. And the question that he asked Jesus, the horn of our salvation, the rescuer, the deliverer, is this. What must I do to have eternal life? What must I do to live forever? What must I do to know that I'm going to heaven when I die? And the reason why I love this story, and there's so many great ones in there, right? The reason why I love this story is because we hear the answer from Jesus. Jesus is getting ready to answer a guy here on earth. Here's what you need to do to know that you've been rescued. Here's what you need to do to know that the horn of of your salvation has kicked in. Here's what you need to know to know that you've been delivered from hell. And so we're not just going to hear my opinion. It has become my opinion because it's in this perfect book. We're not just going to hear the idea of the theology or doctrine or, you know, of this church. It is because it's in this book. But we're going to hear Jesus, his answer to this man. 
And so I want you to listen very closely as we, uh, as we begin to look at this passage of Scripture. I'm going to read verses 17 through 22. Keep your Bible handy because there's a couple of verses we're going to come back to as we continue to hopefully see the Holy Spirit unpack this for us. So here's what it says. Mark chapter 10 and verse 17. Now as Jesus was going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him, and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Now there's the question. Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? In other words, what do I need to do to know I'm living forever? What do I need to do to know that I'm going to heaven when I die? Verse 18, so Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. And he answered and said to him, Teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, One thing you lack. Go your way, sell whatever you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come take up the cross and follow me. But he was sad at this word and went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Let's pray together. Father, again, we just need to pause and ask you (coughs) to convey what only you can convey. And God, I just need to confess before you, you already know this, and before these sweet people, I am so glad it's not on my shoulders to deliver this message. Forgive me for the times that I think it's about me. But God, we desperately need to hear from you today. And God, this this message, it's just for us to understand what you require of us to know that we're secure in you. Not only for a home in heaven, but God, to have that connection and relationship and purpose right here the moment we embrace you. God, help us and draw hearts And we'll be careful to give you every bit of the credit because it's all about you. We love you. We ask it all, again, in the strong name of our King Jesus. Amen. Well, in verse 17, Jesus was walking along and just kind of walking along a road, kind of minding his own business, more appropriately minding his father's business, right? When a man came running to him, fell on his knees before him, and asked this incredible question. He said, what must I do to know I'm going to heaven whenever I die? Now, I begin to wonder, whenever I first read this several years ago, who was this guy that came running to Jesus? I can picture it in my mind. I really wasn't concerned about how tall or short he was or what have you. But what made him tick? Who was this guy that was asking the question in the first place? So I want to introduce to you in a little better way the man who asked Jesus this question. We'll stay within the context of the Scripture, of course. First of all, we know, I believe, that he was an excited guy. He was excited. Jesus' reputation preceded him greatly at this point, and I believe this guy wasn't going to Jesus to try to trip him up or trick him. I believe he really had respect for who Jesus was. He wanted to meet Jesus. I think he was sweating. I think his heart rate was up. He was running, even, to get to Jesus, okay? He was running. Uh, This story is also recorded over in the book of uh, Matthew, and Matthew puts a piece of the puzzle into place that Mark doesn't mention. That's the fact he was a young guy. So we know excitedly a young man came running to Jesus. It's also recorded in the book of Luke. Luke puts you another piece of the puzzle in and mentions something that Mark and, and, uh, and Matthew don't mention, and that's the fact that he was a ruler among the Jews. He was a Judean ruler. He was a very powerful, very influential guy. He was a religious leader, a religious leader. So excitedly running to Jesus was this ruler among the Judeans, a young guy. In all three accounts, it mentions that he had a lot of money. He was a rich guy. So again, running to Jesus excitedly was a rich young ruler among the Judeans, a religious leader, a powerful guy. (coughs) I believe even though he was powerful, he had enough respect for Jesus that he seemed to be humble. Now, nobody can read the heart of another guy, and every man's got an ego. I can testify to that for sure, okay, with me. But I can tell you that at least outwardly, he seemed to be a pretty humble guy because the Bible says that this guy got on his knees on that dirt road in front of Jesus before he popped this all-important question. So he seems to be pretty humble. I believe this guy was also intelligent, okay? Not only excited, not only a rich young ruler among the Jews and influential and powerful and and, and humble, but I believe that he felt Jesus had the answer to the question he's getting ready to ask. I really thought, I really believe he felt Jesus had the answer. Now hear me, I believe he also felt he already knew the answer and Jesus was just going to shore that up. That wasn't the case, but I really do believe that he thought that Jesus had the answer. So I don't know about you, but if somebody had, told me this story for the very first time, only to that point. I'd never heard the story before. And they said, Bob, what do you think's going to happen? <coughs> I would say, this guy's just around the corner from surrendering to Christ. Any moment now, he's going to end up being a follower of Jesus. I mean, think about it. He's asking the right question. 
He's definitely asking the right person, Jesus himself. He seems to have the right attitude. He seems to have humility. I mean, you would think that he was going to come to Christ. That's not the way the story ends. Matter of fact, it ends with, with tragedy, devastation. But nevertheless, we have this guy that came to Jesus and asked this all-important question, what must I do? So we know the question. We know the guy. Now let's listen to the answer. Here's what Jesus begins to say in verse 18 as he begins to give the answer to this rich young ruler. It says in verse 18, So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. So Jesus says to him, he answers his question with a question. He often did that. Hey, bud, hold on a second. Uh, You called me good a little bit ago because you said good teacher. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Why did you call me good? There's none that's good except one, that's God. Now what was Jesus doing here? I believe Jesus was setting a trap. Now, the word trap is a rather strong word, you understand, but it was a trap of love. And I think Jesus was putting a little bit of bait on this trap of love. And here's what I mean by that. He said to this this Old Testament scholar, this religious guy, why did you call me good? No one is good but one, and that's God. I believe he was giving this guy an opportunity to tell him what he knew, or better yet, begin to understand what he didn't know. Because the answer to that would be, That's why I called you good, because you are God. (coughs) You're you're God's son. You're the Messiah. You're the one I've been studying about through all the books of the Old Old Testament. But see, this man knew nothing of the sort. Jesus continues to put a little more bait on this trap of love in verse 19 whenever he says, you know the commandments. Jesus knew he was religious. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. Now, I want to tell you, I came to Christ at age 24. And from age 6 to age 24, I was a member of a couple different good churches. Proper doctrine, great pastors, but nobody can read the heart and mind of a little boy. I walked the aisle at age 6, was baptized, did it again at age 11, was baptized. But it wasn't until age 24 that I realized that my idea of going to heaven was wrong. Because I still had this idea that I believe most people in North America have... And it's what we call the balancing scale theology. It says, if you do more good than bad, you'll squeak into heaven by the skin of your teeth. If you do more bad than good, you're going to have to go to hell. And I'm not being condescending there whenever I say the majority of people in North America believe that. It just makes sense, doesn't it? It just makes sense that surely we can't get something like heaven without having some kind of skin in the game. I mean, (coughs) at least I ought to have to meet him halfway or something, right? And so surely there ought to be enough good works in my life and that's really what I was doing, was thinking about that. But I am so thankful the Bible does, it teaches that, it, that balancing scales is not the way, or I'd still be in trouble, okay? As a matter of fact, here's what the Bible teaches. Going to heaven is a free gift. Everybody say free. free. Say free. free. And here's what it is. We're all sinners. We're stuck. We're helpless. We're hopeless. It better be free. Because any sin in our life separates us from God because he's so holy, He's so clean, so perfect, so pure, he can't even allow sin to come into his presence. So any sin in my life separates me from God. And it's going to take something a lot bigger than my best effort to build that bridge back to having a perfect relationship with God. And God knew that. God knows that even though he wants us in heaven, we have to go to hell. We don't have a choice. So God said, I'm going to send the rescuer, the horn of my salvation. And he sent his son, born of a virgin. He walked on this earth 33 years, 100% God, yet 100% man. He was tempted in all ways like we are tempted, yet he did not sin. He died on a cross for our sins. His blood was shed to cover our sin. His sacrifice was the only thing big enough to cover the wickedness in our life. And he rose from the dead on the third day. And any man, woman, boy, or girl that will come before him and surrender and say, Jesus, I am stuck, I'm helpless, I'm hopeless, I can't do enough works to get me to heaven i have to go to hell i trust you i trust your blood i trust your sacrifice i trust your ability to raise from the dead i trust that to get me to heaven i want you to be my god we know that it's free amen but here's the deal man comes to jesus good teacher what must i do to go to heaven he said why'd you call me good and then jesus mentioned some of the ten commandments It almost sounds like he's talking balancing scale. And he's not. Okay, you know that. (coughs) But here's what he says. Again, do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. Sounds like he's saying if you're a good enough old boy, you might make it. What's Jesus saying? Well, we find that Jesus, sure enough, mentioned 
six of the Ten Commandments. Very, very intentionally, he's God, knew exactly what he was doing, of course, left the first four out, okay? The, the Ten Commandments are found in Deuteronomy chapter 5, Exodus chapter 20. Read those whenever you get home. We're not going to look at them today due to the time factor. But, uh, but you'll find out that Jesus, sure enough, on purpose, did not mention number 1 through 4, but on purpose mentioned only numbers 5 through 10. And if you examine those, here's what we find. We find that the first four commandments, the commandments that Jesus did not, did not mention, have everything to do with a person here on earth being able to have an intimate encounter with God in heaven. The last six commandments, the commandments that Jesus did mention, have everything to do with man's relationship, woman's relationship to other people here on earth. Okay? Jesus knew something about this religious guy. I believe this man was a good man. I believe he tried to be religious. I believe he tried to have good works. I believe he was a good husband. I believe he, he did some things for other people. And Jesus knew that this religious guy knew everything there was to know about being good to other people here on earth. But even with all of his religion, he didn't have a clue that a man here on earth could actually have an intimate relationship with God in heaven. So at this point, as Jesus continued to put a little more bait on that trap of love, he didn't even bring it into the picture. As a matter of fact, <coughs> just to hopefully take the mud out of the water, the first four commandments, the commandments that Jesus did not, did not mention, say something to this effect, uh, make no other, or take no other gods before me, worship me and me alone, make no graven images, uh, remember the, uh, do not take the Lord's name in vain, and remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. All dealing with our relationship to God. The last six, the six that he brought into the picture says, do not commit adultery, that's don't cheat on your spouse, that's a human relationship. Do not murder anyone, that'll definitely put a damper on a human relationship. Do not steal, do not lie, do not defraud or covet, and obey mom and dad. All human relationships. And Jesus was saying, he's got that down. But the first part about knowing God, he doesn't know. So as he laid that bit of bait on that trap of love, in verse 20, the rich young ruler takes the bait. Listen to what it says. And he, the rich young ruler, and he answered and said to Jesus, Teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. He took the bait. He said, Man, Jesus, whew, I thought that's what you were going to say, kind of why I ask. Uh, I want to tell you, I've, I've done all that stuff. Everything you just mentioned, I've done since I was a small boy. As a matter of fact, get this, Jesus. I have never uh, cheated on my wife. I've never murdered anyone. I've never stolen. I've never told a lie. That was a lie, by the way. I've never defrauded. I've always obeyed my parents. According to your answer, the, the gate to heaven is going to be eight miles wide. I'm going to breathe through. I, I'm home free. I've got it made. This guy was relying on his religious experience and his good works. His good works. You know, I want to tell you, men like these are recorded in Scripture of standing in the hot sun for hours having Scripture being read over them. Men like these would be in the temple every time the doors open. Men like these would have probably committed more Old Testament scripture to memory than anybody in this room. He didn't memorize it with his heart, but with his head, you understand, he had it down, right? I mean, this was a good guy, and he thought religion was it. And then Jesus allowed the trap to throw in verse 21. It says in verse 21, Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him, and said to him, One thing you lack he said rich young really you're a great guy you've hood not you you've stood in the hot sun with scripture being read over you you've you've committed hundreds of old testament scripture to memory you're in the temple every day you're a great guy but the thing that you asked me was what must you do to go to heaven when you die and here's my answer good to other people all that stuff something you're missing there's one thing you lack and i can't stress it enough being religious will not get you to heaven. Being religious will not get me to heaven. I'm a Christian with a capital C and a Baptist with a little b. We can't get Catholic enough, Methodist enough, Presbyterian enough, non-denominational enough. It's never going to be about the religion. It's always going to be about Jesus. He is our only way to heaven. I've heard Roger say on multiple occasions, you know, whenever man tries to help out God, it gets complicated real fast. And that's what religion's done. There's one place in the book of James that says, be religious. If the Bible says it enough, it's enough. It, it's once, it's enough. So I'm not knocking religion, but it's not our way. Our way is a relationship with Christ. I had some religion in my life, especially as a small boy. It came alive at age 24 because without Jesus, it was nothing. It was nothing. So Jesus says, you're missing it. So let's look at verse 21 again and see what Jesus says the guy was missing, Okay. Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, 
one thing you lack. Here it is. You ready? Here's what he was missing. Go your way, sell whatever you have, and give it to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. Take up the cross and follow me. Now, hit the brakes. It sounds like he's talking balancing scales. Go sell everything you have and give it to the poor. Isn't that works? What was Jesus saying? The only way that we can know what Jesus was saying and really understand it is look back at the very first clause of verse 21. The very first clause says, Then Jesus looking at him. One translation says, Then Jesus beholding him. What does that mean? Well, if that said, Then Ron looking at Bob, all that would mean is Ron could see me on the outside. Ron would examine me on the outside and say, That guy should be a movie star. You know, stuff like that, right? Wasn't that funny, okay? Uh, actually, it was. Uh, thanks for laughing. I appreciate the... So, but I'm just telling you, I, all we do is look on the outside. I could tell you what color shirt he had on. He could tell me all that. But whenever the Bible says, then Jesus looking at him, then Jesus beholding him, he wasn't looking on the outside. Jesus was examining everything about that man's life. He knew every false motive, every bit of wickedness, every bit of filth, all the garbage, all the good works, all the... All the the, the love for his wife in, in, in an attempt, the good, the bad, everything. Then Jesus looking at him. And so while Jesus was looking at him, he knew exactly who this guy's God was or what it was. And all Jesus said to this guy was the same thing he preached throughout the whole gospel. He said, you've got a God, it's not me. Get rid of your God and I have to be your God. So in this man's case, he said, your God is your money. Go sell everything you have, give it to the poor, pick up your cross, and follow after me. He said the same thing consistently. Now, some in this room, many of us would say, that's kind of good news. Money's not my God because I don't have any, okay? But we all have a God. And Jesus is saying, he has to be our God. The statement, pick up your cross and follow after Jesus, is a powerful statement. And we need to unpack that just a little bit this morning. Back in the day that Jesus said, pick up your cross and follow me, nobody had it as precious jewelry around their neck or in their ears. I think that's great today. But back in that day, the cross meant one thing and one thing only. It meant death. It was a full-on surrender. I'm thankful for a forgiveness gospel, aren't you? But the full gospel is not just a forgiveness gospel. It's a surrender gospel. I'm thankful that he forgives me my sins, but listen, it's not the warm fuzzies and walking down an aisle at a youth camp at age 12 and praying some prayer. You can get saved doing that. But I'm just saying, man, are we, have we embraced Jesus or are we relied upon something that wasn't even Jesus? It's so important. Billy Graham says in the modern day, it's as if to say, pick up your electric chair and follow after Jesus. This is a full-on surrender to Jesus. Now, I gotta make sure I don't put mud in the water here. Going to heaven, it's free, right? Say free. free. It's not my works. It's not my works. But can a person really surrender to that point? Can a person, man, woman, boy, or girl, broken, busted up, wicked people, can we pick up our cross and follow Jesus? The answer to that is yes, but I want to explain it by telling you a story. Once upon a time, there was a king who had a great kingdom. And this king found out that he had cancer, and the doctor said he had a short time to live. So the king knew of a peasant in his kingdom that really loved Jesus. And the king had his soldiers go out and summons this peasant into his chambers. And the peasant was scared to death. He'd never even been in sight of the castle, let alone inside. He was in the chambers of the king himself. His knees were practically knocking together. He wondered, what, what did he do? The king lifted himself from his bed, very frail stature, and he walked across this large chamber floor, and he walked over to the peasant and said, Peasant, he said, Yes, sir. Yes, Your Honor, what can I do? He said, I, I have a short time to live. I have cancer. I understand that you know Jesus and you have a great relationship with God. Can you tell me what I need to do to go to heaven when I die? And the, the peasant said, yes, your honor, I can. I can tell you. Uh, the Bible says that we're all sinners. We're separated from God. We're helpless. We're stuck. We, we can't get there on our own. We need to be rescued 100%. God sent the rescuer, his son Jesus, died on a cross, perfect, so that men like us who are not perfect could live. On the third day later, rose from the dead, paid our sin debt in full. And we need to communicate with God and surrender. We, we need to just pray and talk to him. He said, oh, 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 we just need to pray? Well, no, no, let me, no, 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 you, I just need to pray. 
well, let's just get that out of the way. If I, if I just need to pray a prayer. He said, well, Your Honor, I don't think you're really here, catching me here. here let, me, let me add that you, you need to be willing to come to me right now. You need to be willing. Come down, you know the main drag of the kingdom where you have that marketplace and you have the pig pen there and we're selling all those hogs? You need to be willing to come to me right now. Broad daylight, take off your crown and robe, crawl over that fence, get on your knees in that slop and mud and mire and pray from that, from that mud. You need to be willing to do that. He said, what? Take off my crown and my robe and get on my knees in that mud and slop and mire and claim Jesus as my king. I'll never do it. He said, then you cannot be saved. A couple weeks pass and he, ha- he summons the peasant in again and they had the same conversation. About another week passed, the king getting frail and thinking 24-7, couldn't even sleep at night, just kept thinking about Jesus and realized, man, I, I, I want to surrender to him. He is my only way out of here. I don't care who knows that he's my king. I, I'm ready to go. And he summons the peasant again. The peasant walks into his chambers. The king lifts himself from his bed. As he's walking by the peasant, he said, I'm ready to go. And he said, what's that? He said, I'm going to the pig pen to pray. I'm ready to go. And he opens the door and takes about two steps down the corridor. And the peasant said, sir, your, your honor, where are you going? He said, I'm going to the pig pen to pray. You said I had to go to the pig pen to pray. He said, you're, sir, you were listening. I never said that. He said, you had to be willing to go to the pig pen to pray. Now that you're willing, you can surrender to Jesus right here in the privacy of your chambers. Pick up your cross and follow Jesus. What does that mean? God's looking for perfect people. Nope. Thank God for that, right? But he's looking for willing people. Listen, this is a turn your back on sin, repent, and believe Jesus is your only way to heaven. It's a surrender. Do not, I'm begging you, do not hear me say, work so hard to stop sinning and work so, it's not about works. But it is about someone being willing, not just jumping through a religious hoop, not just trying to do some kind of balance and scale thing, but someone who's saying, Jesus, you're everything, and I know something about me. I'm still going to mess up, and I'm not already conceding, but I'm just saying as long as I'm in this human body, I will have sin, but hear me, I'm willing I'm willing to turn my back on all of it. And as sincerely as I know how, I'm willing to surrender to you. But you've got to take me from here. You see, I did that as a 24-year-old man 35 years ago this month. And I have not been everything I promised God I'd be for him. But he's never stopped being more than everything he promised he'd be for me. And he'll never let you go. It's completely his work, but it's not a religious game. It's not a religious hoop. It's a willing heart saying, I'm willing to surrender. God, you know my heart. I'm glad you're perfect because I'm not, but I'm willing to give it up. And here's where we are with this man. Pick up your cross and follow after Jesus. Human nature is difficult, you know? We slap against one wall or the other. One wall says, If you sin again, he'll drop you like a hot rock, and that's not biblical balance. One wall says, just believe he's out there, and you'll get into heaven somehow. That's not biblical balance. But biblical balance is saying, Jesus, I'm stuck, I'm helpless, I'm hopeless. I, to the best of my ability, I surrender. I'm willing. I'm giving you my life because you gave yours. And that's the relationship. My favorite part of this whole story is back in the first part of verse 21. It says, let's read it again, then Jesus looking at him, we talked about what that meant. He examined every bit of filth, all the garbage, all the trash, everything. Listen to the next two words. Loved him. Let me read that together. Then Jesus looking at him, loved him. I'm telling you, you are precious to God. He is looking for people every day. And on your worst day, he loves you. On my worst day, he loves me. But I know people that say, there's no way God would ever turn his face toward me. I am hopeless. I'm helpless. Listen, I'll promise you, whoever's in this room that might think they're the furthest away from God is first in line to launch his power. He's head over heels in love with you. If you come to the place that you say, I'm stuck, I'm helpless, I'm hopeless, I can't. That's a great place to be in. Because without that step, We can't come to Christ. And then to say, Jesus, I believe that you rescued me. 
and I surrender. You, your blood was shed for me. You died on the cross. You rose from the dead. And I'm counting you and you alone as my way to heaven. And I do not want you just to be the God of my pastor, my priest, my church, my great aunt. I want you from this moment on to be my God. This is you and me one-on-one. That is Christianity. That is the relationship required for him to wash us clean. Listen, he's so big there's nothing he cannot do, including forgive you and me of everything. He's God. He can do that. The story does not end well. Verse 22, as we close, it says, but he, the rich young ruler, was sad at this word and went away sorrowful. It's a strong word. It means to be grieved means he was literally appalled. His heart was torn in two. This was not an easy choice. He, he, he counted the cost, but he said no. Look at it again. But he was sad at this word and went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. He was not willing to give up his earthly treasure to gain treasure in heaven. He wasn't willing to give up his God and to follow Jesus. He wasn't willing. And you know if there was a verse 22 and a half, you know what I believe it would say? I believe it would say, and Jesus watched him walk away. I want you to hear what I mean by that. As much as it broke the heart of God in those sandals standing there that day, he did not say, bless God, turn around or I'll strike you dead in your sandals. I'm trying to give you heaven. He didn't do it. It broke his heart. But he did not make that guy a robot that was going to serve him or else. And he won't do that to you either. You see, the choice is on your shoulders. And today, if you feel that nudge in your heart, that pit in your stomach, that's a God, the the creator of the heavens and the earth, loving us so much that he's drawing our heart. And that's a time for you to surrender to him and be able to say, I can't, done trying, God, you can. I'm trusting you. I'm willing. You take it from here. But I'm telling you, the choice is yours. And you can say no. And you can walk away. But today, he passionately desires you. Another reason why I say if there was a verse 22 and a half, it would say, and Jesus watched him walk away, is because I also noticed that he didn't say, oh, okay, wait, wait, hold on, hold on, just, just stop, turn around. How about this? Sell half of what you got. <laughs> Give it to the poor. Okay, wasn't well, let's make a deal. It was all or nothing. Listen, it was willing, say willing, or not willing. And he walked away. At the end of the 8 o'clock service, One of our precious members came up and said, you know what else I think that verse would say? If it was verse 22 and a half, I said, what's that? She said, I think it'd say Jesus wept, and I agree. His heart breaks for you, and he loves you. He is head over heels in love with you. On your worst days, on the days that I can't stand me, he loves me. And he loves you. And today can be the day. If you're here saying, I'm not 100% sure, the horn of my salvation It's Jesus, and he's made a way. And today, on August 15th, 2022, I don't even know what day it is, is that right? (laughs) Whatever day it is today, (laughs) at 11.43 a.m. 2022, did I say 2022? Wow. (laughs) I was filling out a form the other day. This has nothing to do with, I need the last four digits of my wife's social security number. I always have her number, always memorized. I couldn't remember it. And I texted her and said, what's your last four your social? And she texted four digits with a question mark after it. And she said, she texted right after and said, we're in a mess. We're kind of in Hannah overload right now. So anyhow, but I can tell you, on this day, this year, at this moment, it can be the day you remember for all eternity. If you come before a holy God and just do this, In your heart, God, I'm stuck. I'm helpless. I am not playing games here. 
I'm not just trying to jump through a religious hoop or maybe even with a good heart. Some, so many people jump through those hoops. But I'm telling you, they're great hearts. I'm not mocking or making fun of them. It just makes sense. Balancing scales. But today you say, man, I'm not doing that. I, I'm willing to surrender. And I believe, Jesus, you rescued me full, full on, 100% of the way. And today, I'm trusting your death, your burial, your resurrection to erase all my sin. It's so huge what you did. It covers my sin completely. And today, I want you to be my God. This is you and me one-on-one. If you do that today, for all eternity, for all eternity, he'll never let you go. The horn of our salvation. Let's pray together. Father, again, we just say, God, would you move in this place? We know you've got the power. We know you love every person. And God, I know I'm one that's standing here deserving hell. But I'm going to heaven. And it's not because I'm so good. Jesus, it's because you were so good for me about 2,021 years ago. And so, Father, we just ask for courage, for clarity, and for us to do what you deserve, surrender. And we say thank you for being such a good God that you accept us right where we are. I'm glad you love me too much to keep me the way I am, but even that's been this incredible, loving process. God, you love to bring up sin because you love to forgive, and you love to forget. And that only happens through the blood of your son, the horn of my salvation. But Father, I give courage in this room this morning. We love you. We ask it all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. David's going to continue to play here just for a little while. and I can't help but believe in a group this size that possibly there are some that would say I'm not 100% sure if I died tonight that I'd spend eternity in heaven. You can know you're going to heaven when you die and you can know before you leave this place. And I'm begging you, if you know that tug is going on in your heart, don't take that for granted. Now if I'm twisting your arm, you stay right where you are. If I could twist your arm into heaven, I'd give it the old college try. But it doesn't work that way. But if the Holy Spirit, if God is twisting your arm from the inside out and you know the difference, then this is your day. And I want to encourage you to do something. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. And If you just need to talk to somebody, I'm going to ask you wherever you are just to stand up and make your way right here to one of these front pews. And just sit down on the pew. You don't have to stand. Just sit down on one of these front pews. And somebody will approach you. They'll come to you. You just give it just a minute. Somebody will be there to talk to you and be thrilled to do it. Because you need to know. You need to know. So heads are bowed and eyes are closed. And some are moving, and if you need to move, you, you do that. You do that. We're going to play just for a minute. Heads bowed, and eyes closed. We'll play, play just for a minute here. Heads are still bowed and eyes are closed. Here's something else you can do if you say, man, I just don't know if I can step out, come up and sit on the front pew. I, I, I understand that. I get that. But listen, I, I'm going to be at the back door here shaking hands. Roger will be back there. There will be others back there as well. Man, come to one of us on the way out and just, just kind of whisper to us these three words. I don't know. I don't know. And we'll know you're saying you're not 100% sure if you died tonight, you'd go to heaven. Let us just slip off and share with you in a few minutes' time from God's Word. Uh, It's just too important 
Man, I've grown to love the people in this room. I don't know all of you, but I'm telling you, I love this place. Man, wouldn't it be awful if any of us didn't embrace this freedom, this freedom. We're going to continue to worship with the uh, Lord's Supper. and What a great time to do that. But if you need to talk more, I'll be at the door. Roger will be at the door. Others will be at the door. Love you all. God bless you. Did anyone not receive a communion cup on your way in? If you'll hold your hand up. If I could get a few guys to go back and help and get some of those. We got some guys here. Just please keep your hand up until they get to you. If you're visiting with us and you're a born-again believer, I believe the Bible teaches we're each to examine our own heart. So I believe it's a personal decision between you and the Lord. And as we celebrate communion, it really is perhaps one of the greatest acts of worship. As they did on the first night, first of all, it's an opportunity to look up and to be thankful to God. It's also a time to look back and to remember that Christ died for us. It's also a time to look forward. Jesus said we are to do this until he comes back. So as we take communion, we're really celebrating not only his death, but also anticipating one day he's coming again. I believe the Bible teaches we're to look within and to examine our own heart. And so hopefully you'll have just a moment to reflect on your own heart. And then finally, I think it's an opportunity to look around because the church at Corinth really was very divided. And it's really bothered Paul. I believe communion is a celebration that what Christ did is an opportunity for us to be truly family. And so if there's anything that we have against a brother or sister, we need to go to them. We need to try to make that right on this incredible journey. I can't think of a better way to end the service than by celebrating communion together. And so these particular cups, if you have them, as long as you haven't pulled any tabs, Turn the juice down, and you can open the top tab there and get the piece of bread out. And then you can turn it over with the juice up and just kind of peel that back. And so in just a moment, we're going to take the bread, and then we're going to take the juice all at the same time. As Jesus, on that very first night, as he gave communion he said as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup I want you to remember me and so as we eat the bread and drink the cup let's just truly with a thankful heart be thankful to the Lord that he loved us and so I want us all to look up and just say thank you Jesus, thank you, Jesus. so let's eat the bread and drink the cup Let's stand together. I want to have a word of prayer. We're going to close with a song. So glad to see you today. On the way out, if you don't mind, just taking these and putting them in the trash can on the way out. So glad that you're here. And hopefully every person that walks out of here today knows that they know that they know Jesus. Hopefully he is the horn of your salvation. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that we can come and worship together. We thank you, Lord, for the incredible love that you have for us. And I pray not one person would walk out of this room today without being completely surrendered to you. So, Father, fill us with your spirit. Just empower us to live for you moment by moment. That, God, everywhere we go, your love would spill out of our life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.